Can you hear me okay? Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to talk about a, a method that I, I think might be useful for getting at the grazing rates of microzooplankton in particular. And it's, it's something that I haven't published, so I'm on shaky ground, it hasn't been peer reviewed. And um, it's, but I've been sitting on it, the idea for so long, and I haven't got it out there that I thought I should make an effort. And um, it's involved people both at PML, where I was about six years ago, so Glenn Tarrant and Susan Kamantz. And then I've roped in people now at Bigelow as well to sort of help me try and answer this problem or try and develop this method really. And we've been lucky enough to just recently get some NSF eager funding to kind of promote it. And I, I did pass the idea before um, Diane last year or so, and she, she sort of said, oh, it kind of makes sense. And um, <laughs> that, that gave me some encouragement to carry on and put a proposal in. But what, some of the motivation really is that if, if as, as Ben pointed out, microzooplankton grazing might be an understudied aspect of ocean biogeochemistry. And if you look, do a search through Scopus for, well, primary production in ocean and ocean and bacterial production viral infection microzooplankton. Since 1980, then you get the least hits for microzooplankton grazing. That maybe suggests that some, you know, we're not putting enough effort into it. And one of the reasons might be that we don't really have the tools to address the problem. So there's, there has been, you know, Diane introduced the dilution experiment, and um, that was, you know, Landry and Hazard's paper, and in, in the sort of mid '80s, and we, a lot of us, have been using that ever, ever since. But there has been some progress in that method, and I'll, I'll just you know, highlight some of these. Kind of the first studies really to apply, some of the first studies anyway, to apply molecular approaches to sort of microzooplankton grazing. And what they did was carry out the dilution experiment. And if, if you don't know what that's about, then it's what you do is take a whole load of seawater, filter it, add it in different, in varying proportions to the whole water. And in that way, you're decreasing the encounter rate. So you're separating predator and prey and you're decreasing the encounter rate reducing the grazing pressure. So as you de decrease the amount of unfiltered water, you're decreasing the grazing pressure. So if you then measure apparent growth of the phytoplankton, you should see, in, in theory, you should see a sort of linear regression or a linear fit. And um, you can calculate a, a growth coefficient, a growth coefficient in the absence of grazing and a the slope gives you a mortality rate, or a mortality And what these folk have done is to use qPCR to quantify the apparent growth of heterosigma, so toxic algae. And they've shown that this is chlorophyll, so this is chlorophyll analysis at the top here in two different stations, and then here's a heterosigma qPCR analysis. And you see that there's really much higher growth and much higher grazing rates on that particular component Phytoplankton. So it's, a, it's quite a neat sort of development of, of the method. And then there's been some, this is actually a copepod study, but it shows some potential, I think, of applying sort of molecular type approaches. So these folk were looking for Alexandrium that had been grazed by copepods. So this is, a, this is a local Hui group. And what they show here is that you can detect Alexandrium up to four hours after it's been ingested in a copepod, if you're looking for a specific amplicon. And um, they showed that you can, even when there's like 10 Alexandriums in the water, 10 per liter or something, you can still detect that uptake rate in, in, co in some copepods. So you only need one Alexandrium to do this. And so maybe that sort of approach, if you combine you know, molecular, 
qPCR with cell sorting, genomics, sort of cell sorting facility like we've got at Bigelow or something like that. You can come up with some really neat grazing approaches as well. And then one of the other ways that um, things are developing, I think, is due to these you know, high frequency measurements that are becoming more and more commonly carried out. And some of the people who are involved in this are in the audience, I'm sure. But this is a really nice study where they transect from Hawaii to California and back again. And we're able to calculate the production rate of prochlorococcus based on differences in cell size and cell cycle analysis. And then from the difference between the actual sort of abundance, the natural abundance, and that production rate, they can calculate a mortality rate as well. And show some synchrony. So this is the mortality rate here and the, the growth rate. And so it shows some really neat like, um, aspects of the sort of interaction between predator and prey. Anyway, I'll get on to my, um, my approach. And really, it's based on, on what's called the functional response. And um, that's, that's about how do, protists, how do protozoan grazers respond when you change the abundance of their prey. And if what I've done is taken some of Peter Verity, the late Peter Verity's work, and um, he, he did some really neat culturing work with strobilidium, this ciliate, grazing on isochrysis primnesia bite. Came up with maximum clearance rates of 5.7 microliters per cell per hour and a handling time of um, 21 seconds. And if you take that data, he showed that it, if you change the prey abundance, plot that the ingestion rate per per predator against against the prey abundance, then you get this typical what's called a type two Hollings response. It's rectangular hyperbole that you can fit a Michaelis Menten fit to and get a maximum ingestion rate and a half saturation level. So that's 170 isocrisis per protozoan per hour. So that these guys really chomp. Um, and if you take that data, say, same data, and you look at what's happening to the prey, and you can calculate an apparent growth rate. So if you apply a gross growth rate of nearly a doubling a day, and um, you can calculate apparent growth rate, say if you had five ciliates to that, five ciliates per mil to that water. And as you increase the prey abundance, and that apparent growth rate should should increase and again show some sort of um, hyperbole and you couldn't fit, in this case I fit uh, something like the P versus I plat model to the data. And that U max gives you an indication of the grazing, how, how much you've reduced the grazing pressure on, on, the, on the phytoplankton. Now, hopefully it'll become a bit so what you can do is set up this sort of experiment so that you have a constant a series of treatments, constant abundance of the natural prey, and then you add increasing numbers of surrogate prey to try and impact you know, their functional response. And if you do that, then what? So here's the gross growth rate of the phytoplankton, about a doubling per day. Um, here's the grazing coefficient as you're saturating that. As you're increasing the sort of saturation of the predator, its grazing coefficient goes down. And the apparent growth rate goes up. And if you normalize that apparent growth rate to the net growth rate, then you can fit this model and you can come up with that U max or max max um, value and come up with a grazing, effectively a grazing coefficient. And this alpha value gives you an idea, that's the slope, gives you an idea of how effectively you're saturating that grazing. 
if you're going to do that experiment, then you need certain characteristics in your, in your surrogate prey. I, I won't go through all of this, but it, it doesn't actually matter, I don't think, if the surrogate prey isn't grazed by the grazer. As long as it takes some time for the grazer to handle or you know, select against that. So that's that handling time that Verity came up with, 21 seconds. As long as it takes some time, eventually you're going to set it's going to saturate the grazers. So what happens when you actually try and do this? So we, we took part in one of the UK SOLAS cruises, and it was really an Ardeen biogeochemistry cruise. But it, so this is the Northeast Atlantic, and we did sort of six stations and spent three or four days at each one of them in some sort of Lagrangian mode. And um, we kind of piggybacked some trials of this approach on, on that cruise. And um, we were lucky enough to have two flow cytometers on board. And then, you know, this gives you the sort of size scale of, of um, so here's Sinecococcus prochlorococcus. You can just about see bacteria. So we really focused on, on those organisms. And if you Look at a flow cytometric plot, then here's the 90, 90 degree light scatter versus red fluorescence. You can pick out the prochlorococcus population, Sinecococcus, and then these are the latex beads that we were using as surrogate prey. And you can see there's different po populations of latex beads. So these are where they've doubled up or tripled up. But actually, if you, if you do the counts on them, then it, that's, a very, that's only 1% or 2% of the actual total population. And we, we generally did, did sort of 10 incubations where we added different amounts of these polystyrene fluorescent beads to a, to a liter of water. And then we incubated it in situ 24 hours, well, simulated in situ, so it, um, for 24 hours and took T0 and T24 for the measurements of the phytoplankton. And then if you plot the apparent growth rate, say prochlorococcus, then you, then you do get an increasing growth rate with increasing saturation, and the same for Sinecococcus. And if you normalize that to the, to the net growth rate, uh, then you can fit this function and come up with a, a grazing coefficient and um, an alpha as well. And if you take these two experiments, then for prochlorococcus, you get a, a, a net growth of 0.15 per day, a grazing mortality of minus one per day, and a gross growth or a, a growth in the absence of grazing is the product of those two values. And so, same for the Sinecococcus. So in this experiment, anyway, it looked like it makes some sort of sense. And we did eight, eight experiments during that cruise. And this is sort of summarizes the prochlorococcus data. So we're looking at net growth, grazing coefficients, and gross growth or growth in the absence of grazing anyway. And um, you can see, in, in general, their, their numbers that kind of make sense. Um, yeah, the, the grazing's fairly constant level and fairly well balanced so that, so there's probably a, a, there is a net net growth in the prochlorococcus population and we carried these out at about 55% light levels so you might expect them to be beating grazing at that point say if the mixed levels if the mixed layer prochlorococcus population in the mixed layer is kind of constant then 55% light levels they might just be out competing the grazing and we carried out some dilution experiments. We actually we weren't able to do them on the same day, but we carried out eight of those as well. And we only got significant results in, in four of them, and we didn't try and sort of interpret them in any other way other than a linear regression. But um, you can see they're kind of kind of the similar. Kind of seeing how they're different, you know, different n numbers there. They're kind of set the same range of rates. And the Sinecococcus values weren't quite so 
convincing, but um, the growth and grazing rates when we could measure them, certainly the growth rates were much were higher than the Prochlorococcus. And, and these, these successful sort of experiments really occurred you know, when we were nearer the Cape Bird Islands in the, where there were more Seneca coccus about and we could get better, better counts of the Seneca coccus population. But I think we were, we were partly struggling for you know, decent statistics down at this, in the more or, oligotrophic waters down here. And again, you can sort of summarize those, those values and, and they're not you know, we only got three significant results for the dilution experiments and five for the saturation. But that, they're not very far apart. So I, I should have written this stuff up and published it, but I, I was a bit nervous about it, really. And I wanted to go back into the lab and do some really, you know, understand the real fundamentals of the, of the approach. And um, so we've started doing that some extent, and we're using Oxyrus marina, which is a very, you know, a commonly used protozoan and pretty unrepresentative, really, of the ocean microzooplankton. But it's easy to grow and it's easy to work with. But um, it actually turns out that Oxyrus has a really, really high saturation level. So you, in order to get anywhere near that sort of saturation level, then you're having to add 10, 10 to the 6 micromonas per mil. And that's, that's really, that water's pretty soupy at that point. So it, it's, um, and these, these things grow in rock pools on the shore, and they're used to really high concentrations of prey. So it kind of makes sense. So if you try and saturate that organism with beads, then you just end up with too many beads, really, to, you know, the, the number of beads starts inhibiting the um, phytoplankton growth rates. It's really difficult to interpret the data. You also have to use lots and lots of beads, and that gets pretty expensive. They're not cheap, these polystyrene green fluorescent beads. So we've started using GFP E. coli as an alternative, and you can just grow that up in a day or two, and it actually works really, really well. So it's a great sort of surrogate. But it, there are some drawbacks, and I'll get on to that. So we've, got, we've started actually using, instead of Oxyrus, we've started using this Ochromonas as the predator in, in our cultures, and that's much, much more representative. So Ochromonas species are mixotrophs, but they have a sort of spectrum of mixotrophy, and this one's really a voracious grazer, so it's working out pretty well. So I won't go too much. So what are, what are the advantages of this approach? Well, one big advantage is that it doesn't involve that filtration step that Diane talked about. So you're not generating, you know, you're not changing the chemistry of the water through filtration and you don't have that time consuming the constraint if you're trying to do this. Um, it lends itself to flow cytometry, and so you can do fast sample throughputs and pretty accurate counts generally. Importantly, really, compared with the dilution experiments, you, you're, not, you're not reducing the abundance of the natural prey, so your statistics are much, you know, you, your counts are at the natural levels. In the dilution, you might reduce that to 10%, and then you're trying to determine a grazing rate at that much lower number, with that much lower number of um, counts, so it becomes statistically less robust. And, and that's what I've tried to show here. It's, um, and, and if you're using fluorescent beads or say those E. coli, then you can, if you take those samples and look under the microscope, you can actually identify maybe which microzoa plankton are doing the grazing and which microzoa plankton you're um, um, saturating. And yeah, this last bit really is why I, why I did came up with this method in the first place, and I'll, I'll go on to that. I'm really a trace gas person, so I kind of dabble in, in the grazing side of things. 
yeah, if I'm known for anything, then it's working on DMS. And, um, you know, DMS is a product of lots and lots of microbial processes and photochemical processes. But one of the processes that generates DMS is DMSP, is grazing of DMSP containing phytoplankton. And that either releases the DMSP to the dissolved phase where it gets potentially transformed to DMS by bacteria, or it might produce DMS directly. So what I was trying to do as a postdoc was trying to figure out how important this process was, that DMSP grazing in the DMS generation. So we did lots of dilution experiments where we diluted, ran the experiments, and measured DMS concentrations at the same time, and tried to see any trends. Does DMS production increase with increasing grazing pressure? But it's really difficult because when you filter the water, then you get an in, potentially get an increase. So this is potential percentage of filtered seawater get an increase in that DMS concentration. So you're generating DMS. And then if, if there's particular algae around, that DMS P dissolve that you also get release in the filtered water gets transformed to DMS by enzymes that are in, in the water that are released as well. So cleavage enzymes that are released. So you're getting DMSP generated, turned into DMS as well. So you, you have a sort of a double whammy going on. So it took us a lot of time and effort to try and piece together a few experiments that showed the um, impact of grazing on DMS production. But what you can do is maybe saturate the grazers and use that approach. So if you add um, surrogate prey, the varying levels, so this is how many times <laughs> fold the natural abundance of nanophytoplankton in this case, or incubate those, um, carry out the same sort of experiments, incubate them over 24 hours and measure the DMS, then you get a, the more saturation of the grazers that you carry out the less DMS production you get. So it might be a useful tool. We, we've only done a few of these experiments, but it might be a useful tool for doing those sorts of experiments or trying to understand grazing-mediated nutrient regeneration or gradient trace gas recycling, that kind of, kind of thing. So it does appear to provide some useful information. You could possibly abbreviate it in the same way that people are abbreviating the sort of dilution approach just by doing a couple of um, levels of dilution. You could do a couple of levels of saturation so you can really increase your throughput. Um, targeted at different size classes, maybe. Yeah, that's just what I've done. That's it. Thank you. Do um, Hello. Oh. I'm still processing, but I, I, I'll just go ahead and ask you, does, does it matter if there's a different kind of functional response curve with this method, like a you know, there are other kinds of functional responses other than the type two you show, the sigmoidal one and the, yeah. the one where there's a, um, a grazing threshold. But I'm trying to think if, you're, if the saturation is the important part, whether that even matters. Can you help me with that? Well, I think if you, know, if you have a type three model with the sigmoidal, then I think you're, you're gonna saturate them eventually anyway and same right. with the threshold. <laughs> The yeah. problem arises if it's just a linear okay. point where you have to then add so many surrogate prey that you impact the growth of the phytoplankton that you're trying to study. So this is incredibly difficult to distinguish between the different types of functional responses because all the action is at the low end where there's a lot of death. So empirically, I think it's fairly impossible to distinguish 